Hello. Thank you everyone for coming here today. Benjamin Coyolana is an English hip-hop musician that has shot to fame as a result of his profound and honest lyrics. With his album Yesterday's Gone, nominated for both the Mercury Prize and the Brit Awards, and Ben traveling the world to show you his music, there's a very, very specific reason why you're here today. And for all you fans, oh, ain't nothing changed, ain't nothing changed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lord Karna. <laughs> it worked. Yeah, I did it. I thought I'd do it. So, first of all, thank you for coming here today. Um, one of the things I'd say is that we have a lot of guests come, and I've never seen such a response to someone as announcing that you're coming. Uh, so, thanks very much. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me. So, what we want to work out is what was Little Law Karna like? Uh, you grew up in South Croydon. Yeah. Uh, what were you like as a kid? Annoying. Okay. No, I was loud. Um, yeah, I used to cause a lot of trouble. I, didn't, I wasn't malicious. I was just m mischievous, I think. Yeah. Yeah, same now. Naughty? Yeah. Can we have some, what kind of a thing? Um, I, uh, when I was younger, one time I um, was at a pub with my mum and my brother and my dad, my stepdad, and I jumped off of a, like, off, off a wall and cracked my chin open. And so I went to hospital then and there and got them to inject my chin and stitch it back up. And then I went out and did a backflip off a wall, knocked myself out, and went straight back in. So that's, how right. I, that's the kind of stuff I used to get up to. Okay, and, and you speak a lot about your mum and a lot about your stepdad. Yes, yes. Um, Can you tell us a bit about what your family life was like back home? Uh, yeah, it was, um, so my, uh, my dad, so my stepdad, so my dad, my actual dad left when I was really young, um, so I, I didn't really know him, I saw him a bit, but so I was with my mum for a few years, and then my stepdad came and saved me and my mum and looked after us. Um, yeah, we lived in South London, moved from West Norwood to Croydon, uh, yeah, it was brilliant. My mum and dad used to listen to a lot of beautiful music, and I was so they used to listen to like a, I guess quite an eclectic mix. They listened to like folk, Bob Dylan, uh, David Bowie, uh, some funk and soul, blues, everything, any, anything you could think of, Leonard Cohen, whatever. But it was all storytelling. So when I went off to find music, like uh, when I went to find hip hop and to listen to grime and, and jazz and stuff, I wanted to discover. I was looking for stuff of the same ilk, so stuff with storytelling in it, but just my kind of spin on it, I guess. Yeah, and so you were always into your music as well? Yeah, massively so, yeah. Were you always creative? Um, I think so. Um, yeah, my mum, there's a poem my mum wrote about me on, uh, on my album, which is, I think, the best verse on my album, if I'm, if I'm being honest. Um, which she wrote there and then, actually. But, uh, yeah, but she, it's basically, she, she says that I, she kind of explains me, and I think she does it a lot better than me. I'm kind of not very good at talking about myself like that. Yeah. Well, that's good, because we've got an hour yeah, yeah, of it. Yeah, <laughs> You I'll grow, I'm going to warm into it, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, no, we've, got, we've got time. Um, <laughs> so, you speak a lot about your stepdad. If you don't mind me asking, um, one of the things that I've heard is you didn't see your dad that much growing up. Mm, yeah, yeah, so yeah, my, my biological dad I didn't see that much. I see him, like, I see him every, um, every other weekend, and then, like, once a month, and then once every three months and whatnot. We're in touch a bit now, though, which is nice, yeah. after a long time, so. How, can I ask how that happened? Or? Um... Because I became a rapper and he wanted some money. No, it's not. Um, <laughs> uh, what happened? No, just we, we kind of always in contact a bit, but I think it's difficult. You know, I never really used to see it from a dad's side. Some men are just not meant to be dads. Do you know what I mean? It's not. I, I think every man is meant to be a dad, but he would argue that some are not meant to, and so he just didn't want to be in touch that much. But your your stepdad, you're hugely influenced. Yeah, by. yeah, yeah, massively. So, well, yeah, because he, in effect, is my dad. He's the one who raised me. You know, tucked me in at night, taught me how to shave. What a little. Uh, Stuff I have still. Yeah, uh, yeah no, he, he did. He, he was one who showed me music, played football with me in the garden, you know, did all the things that dad's supposed to do. So just because I didn't come from him doesn't mean that I'd, 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 I'm not part of him, you know, or he's not part of me, sorry. Yeah, and so when you were growing up, what would you say your best childhood memory was? Loads. Um, every, every time I was around the dinner table with my mum, my dad, my granddad, my gran, my little brother, yeah, just when, when my whole family was together. Yeah. Can we have just like a, couple, a story or two? Oh, Ideally. How many stories do you fucking want, man? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, you should have told me. I would have prepared loads of stories. Um, <laughs> what is a good story? I mean, but there's, uh, so we used, to have, we used to have dinner at my nan's house a lot because they lived in Streatham um, on a road called Tinney Terrace. Yeah. Um, which is, there's a, I wrote a song about it. And um, we used to go around for dinner a lot. Because um, my mum would work, and for a little while it was just me and my mum, and even when my stepdad moved in, he was uh, working in the city, so he would be working as well. So I, they were like, it was like babysitting for me. But I, they were just, I was really close to them, and one day, I had like a big thing about fi fire, 
And so, <laughs> so I um, so what I used to do is I used to take all of the all of the toilet roll and the kitchen roll that they they bought and put it in the bath and and set fire to it. Uh, and one time we were supposed to be having dinner and I'd forgotten about it, so we all had dinner, and everyone was there. My mum was there by this time, and we all sat down eating dinner. Someone was like, "Can you smell smoke?" And I was like, "No, no, no, no." Just <laughs> eating away, but I genuinely couldn't, wasn't thinking about it at all. And then someone was like, "No, there's definitely smoke." I was like, "Oh fuck, that's definitely the fire from the bath." When it says, and the whole, the whole, the whole bath had like peeled on itself, and the, the fire curtain had set on fire, and it was like plastic, yeah. so it was like smoking. Not, yeah, not the best. So those are my, those idea. are my best <laughs> memories of being at home. <laughs> you know I mean? Okay. Um, can you talk us through how you went from, because you weren't always a rapper. No. Um, you started Brit school, yeah. and you were, you were considering becoming an actor, weren't you? So I just want to, I feel like you can't see me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking heavy chairs, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah no, I did. So, I, 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 to tell the truth, I have always been a rapper because I've always been a writer. So, I've always, hang on. Should I've always been like, I've always, no, 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 sorry, I, sorry, I, I just kind of want to give you a bit and also want to give them a bit, do you know what I'm okay. saying? No, I, um, and I've always been a writer, so I have. So I, I guess I used to write raps, but I wasn't thinking I wanted to be a rapper. I wanted to be a football player and a chef and an actor, and then also a rapper. All of them? Yeah, yeah, all at the same time. But yeah. no, so yeah, I went to, I went to the Brit school. I was fascinated by, by theatre because um, it was something I could do, so I'm dyslexic. And so when I was at school, I was very used to being told by my teachers that I wouldn't amount to much uh, in, a, in a literary sense. So if, if, if it came to academic work, I was good at it, but I, you know, I, I wasn't ever kind of told I, I should pursue it. But with acting, it was the one, honestly, it was the one class I could do at school where I didn't have to write anything down. So I used to enjoy it, and that's why I pursued it, because I didn't have to write, because I was embarrassed about my writing. Yeah, because you, you speak about your dyslexia and you speak about your ADHD mm -hmm. uh, in your songs. Yeah. What, I mean, like, what, what drives you to do that? Because one of the things I read is that you say that ADHD is one of the best things that's ever happened to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's the best and the worst thing about me, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it, it, but it is me. I mean, it's not uh, with labels like that. It's difficult with special educational needs. You know, neurodiverse is what they're called um, in a place like this. Uh, that that like they're, they're labels, and so you you then put them, take them as something that's separate to the person themselves. But, you know, I am myself, and part of myself is ADHD. So if I say, yeah, I'm cool, but I have ADHD, it means that it's something that's separate from me. Like it hangs out over here, but it doesn't. It's here. It's here. It's here. It's all like yeah. just like all the other parts of me are. So. Uh, have you always been so positive about stuff? No, not really, man. I'd like, I, I, my mum was a teacher of children with special educational needs, so she um, explained to me when I was very young what ADHD was, and that helped me because I had like, a, a, a deeper understanding of myself from very young. So when, you know, when I went to school and I was in class with other people and they were saying they had ADHD, I was quite shocked because at first I had quite a negative understanding of it, like you would when you're younger, so there was kids in my class who had ADHD, and then my mum said to me a couple of weeks later, we went to do like, she tested me at home, and she said, you've got ADHD, and I said, no, no, I'm nothing like those kids at school, you know, I'm not weird, I'm not this, I'm not that, and she was like, it's not about that, yeah, but that was how I felt, and obviously how a lot of other people feel about it, until you understand it, and for me, gaining a deeper understanding when I was young meant that by the time I got to the start of secondary school, I knew it, there was nothing anyone could tell me, it's like the, the final bit in 8 Mile, you know, where Eminem yeah. says everything about him before they can say it, and then yeah. he's like, yeah, what are you going to say now, that's how I felt. Yeah, so I actually have to move my chair back. Cause it's, it's, cause it's I'm angry. sorry, man, but I just... <laughs> um, where was I? Um, so, so, so you left school, you went to Brit school, but you mm. didn't make it the whole way through Brit school. No, I did. I was at Brit school for the whole time. It was my oh, uh, right. university I was at. But that's, that's a misconception, because that, that, people say that a lot, so that's not your bad. Yeah. Um, no, no, yeah, no I, was there, I was there for four years. I went from a secondary school called Whitgift, okay. which is actually a, was actually a public school, private school. Um, wicked Education. Yeah. Some of the kids were a bit weird, but it was good, man. Yeah. It was, it was <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah, welcome to uh, school. I'm joking, I'm joking. No, no, it was, it was, it was wicked because um, that was one of the first places where I was treated with a bit of respect, even though I had special educational needs, because there was a wicked um, SEN department there. And that was a school that you had to, um, you know, you had to t test to get in there. So I had to do um, an entrance exam, and, you know, I, I did well enough in my entrance exam for them to feel like I was, you know, intelligent enough to be part of the school. So it was the first time I'd ever, ever in my life been told as much as I was dyslexic, had ADHD, etc., that I could amount to something academically. So yeah, it was a bit of a kudos for me. So you started writing music. How did that come about? Was there a moment where you decided this is what I want to do as my as my full time thing? I just, I just used to do it because it helped me out. I, honestly, uh, I used to write rhymes. I have done for as long as I can remember, and it's such a shit thing to say because everyone says it, and it's probably yeah. usually not that true. But it, like I. I, was, I wasn't writing to be a rapper. I didn't really probably even know what a rapper was when I started writing poems. I just liked words. I think my dyslexia had something to do with it because I used to look at words differently. You know? So I, what I loved about poetry at school was that everything else um, at school, um, you know, you had, there was a certain way to do it. There was a done way. So if you were doing 
if you if you uh, th there's a right answer so you do math there's an answer to that or if you're if you're annotating someone else's work then what you say is graded and it, there's a, there's an answer and if you say the right thing then you're going to get more points but with poetry when it came to writing poetry in class you know if i if i spelt something wrong it didn't matter if i put a grammar in the wrong place it made it better than made it worse and so uh. It was the one place where I, I couldn't be wrong, you know? It's and I was so used to being wrong. It's a good tip. Can't get bad marks if you do poetry. Yeah. Um, Real talk. And so you, so you did your first tour. Yeah. And your first tour was in Dublin as a supporting act. Yeah, yeah. Just, it was one show. I supported um, MF Doom. Yeah. How was it? Yeah, nuts. Um, it, came about, it came about completely by accident. I knew, like, a guy I knew at the time was just saying that... Uh, he was supported and needed some help. He didn't have enough songs. So he was like, would you like to play a few songs? So I did yeah. play a few songs, much to the annoyance of the people from people at my school, much to the fantastic happiness of myself. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, we, didn't, we didn't meet him, though. We actually just left. I don't know if any, any of you know MF Doom, but he's like a, a rapper. Uh, MF Doom MF stands for Metal Face, and he like keeps his identity hidden, so he has like a metal mask that he wears at all times. And we went to the backstage to try and chat to him, and there was just loads of plastic versions of the mask scattered around the room. But that grew fast because you went on to support Joey Bardas, not that yeah, long. Yeah, 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 I did, I did. Um, was, yeah, what was that like? It was mad. That was actually, so I, I dropped out of university um, uh, because a lot of stuff changed. My dad passed away and I went from being able to, to spend money on uni to not being able to afford it because I, the money that I was spending on that, I, I felt like it was much better placed elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I dropped out. My idea was actually to just become a chef. I wanted to get a job in the kitchen and just start working. But there was one support act that we were offered just before Joey Badass. And I was like to my mum, I was like, I'm thinking about dropping out of uni because I want to give you some money. And she was like, you don't need to do it. Don't worry about it. We'll be fine. And I was like, no, I want to give it a go. I want to do this tour. And so I deferred for a year at first and we went on this tour and then we did another one, which is a Joey Badass one. And they started to uh, snowball and then I never went back. Do you find it surreal that, that you come from where you come from and yeah, you're kind of hanging out with the high flyers. Do you still find it surreal? Or is it yeah, 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 massively so, because I'm not a high flyer. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, I'd, yeah, but I'm not, and you can yeah. say but I just, So the other day, the best example of this is like two days ago, me, my missus, Tomo, this is my missus and my manager, Tomo, right here. Um, we were, um, went to, David Beckham um, was launching like a grooming product, and he asked for me directly to perform at his show. My dad was a massive Man United fan, and I'm a massive Liverpool fan, but David Beckham is a hero, no matter who you are, or if, I guess if you like football. But being with, being, being with him, being near him, talking to him is, is surreal as fuck because I, I don't know, he's a, he's, a, he's a celebrity in my eyes. I'm not a celebrity. Yeah. You know? So you've just come back from a tour of Australia. Yeah. You've toured Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, later in the year, you've got South Korea, France, the UK. What's your best gig moment ever? And you've done Glastonbury, you've done Best mm -hmm. of All. Um, what's what's your, your kind of like most memorable moment? Glastonbury. Um, this year, this this year, just gone. The summer just gone. Okay. Um, yeah, it was. We were playing alongside. Like so, the f annoying thing about festivals is, is you usually you clash with other artists. And so, if you find out who you're playing against, not playing against, but who you're playing at the same time, at, you, you can. So I, I always get worried because I think that these people are going to take all the all of the crowd. And so we played in this, in this big tent called the John Field. Sorry, oh. um, <laughs> it's my first time with Justin Timberlake in Dan and Um <laughs> Yeah, we played. We were playing against. Like, we were playing at the same time as Ron and Jules and Bad Bad Not Good and whatnot. Who are people I'm big fans of for one, who I wanted to see, but also knew that they have big followings in London and in the UK. So I thought no one would turn up, and the tent was packed. And at the end, um, I brought my mum out on stage and got her the, the applause that she deserved. And um, yeah, at the end, because it was televised, there was a lot of young men um, who was who were like caught on camera crying. And I thought it was the most important thing that, that um, gets me quite emotional talking about, actually. But, like, the, f the fact that, you know, that men felt comfortable to cry in front of their friends at a place where, you know, you know they should be having fun. But, to, but for it to be, like, a positive thing, for them to be hugging each other and not for it to be a negative, you know, oh, you're weird for crying. But actually, like, yeah, me too. I've got feelings, you've got feelings. It's yeah. human, so... Yeah, it was wicked. That's, yeah. that's huge. Did you, did you know you were going to bring your mum on stage? No, no, no. She was just on the side. And I, w I, I wanted her to do the poem, but she's too... She gets, like, kind of she gets like stage fright. Understandable, so she didn't want to do it. And did you say the poem was in one of your songs? Yeah, yeah it's on a song called The Son of Jean. So that song actually, it's a little bit of a long story. I can tell you it though if you want to hear it. I guess we've got an hour. Yeah, we've got, we've <laughs> got And got you love a story. Yeah, no, so my dad made an album um, before he passed away that no one knew about. Um, and then when he died, um, my mum found it. Um, and as much as it was quite heartbreaking, actually found it afterwards, it was wicked because it was like, you know, we had something to listen to. We, had, we could hear his voice again. And um, I really, we kind of got quite obsessed with it. At first, I didn't listen to it at all. I found it very difficult to listen to it, obviously, because it was a tough thing I was going through at the time. But when I finally listened to it, I listened to it front to back, and there were two songs on it that I loved. Um, and one of them was called Yesterday's Gone, which is why I called my, my album Yesterday's Gone. And, and th there's like a yeah. secret track at the end of the album, which is one that's the song of his. But also, there was another song called The Drifter, 
that I sampled um, with a guy called Quez. So we, we just chopped it up and used it. And so the, the, the voice you hear at the beginning of the song is actually my dad's voice. And I figured if, you know, I, I made this song. What I loved about the album is it kind of immortalized my dad. And so I figured if I got my mum and my dad on the same song, then I could immortalize them together, you know? So then forever they'd be together, it was my idea. So I asked her to write a poem and she was, yeah, up for that's it. That's yeah, how it happened. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you go about writing songs? Because a lot of them, well, most of them come from quite like nostalgic memories. Um, like, do you sit down and think, today I'm going to write a song? Uh, or do you like, walk along well, and you're like, hey, I've got a song? Do you know what? It's different now than it was before. So, but really, it's, it's always the same. I like, it differs from, from song to song. So if uh, one time, you know, something bad's happened to me that, that second, I, usually I can write when I'm sad. And I think it makes sense because if I'm happy, I want to enjoy being happy. I mean, I'm sitting yeah. in my room and write about how happy I am. I want to go and be happy, do you know what I'm saying? But if you're angry, it's very difficult to write because it's very difficult to sit in one place. For me, especially, I want to break things and, you know, shout at people. But when I'm sad, that's the one time when I can lock away because I need that. So yeah. for me, that's how I usually write. But uh, the difficulty with that is, you know, if you want to keep making music and I'm not that sad anymore, no. you know? But, but, but things are still difficult for me, you know? So I think it's about finding the truth in, 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 in what's difficult. Um, which I think some, some people don't tend to do. But yeah, these days if I go into a studio, I have a conversation with whoever I'm making music with that day and I find out what they're feeling about and what they're worried about and then they ask me what I'm worried about and I end up writing about things that I didn't even know I was worried about. So it's actually these days about me finding out stuff that's locked deep inside. Yeah, you said it's changed now that you've become a professional rapper. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Do you, do you ever feel like it's, a, it's an issue that you're asked to write songs? Do you feel like it goes downhill? Or? No, because I, no, no one can tell me to write songs. I mean, I think a few people think they can tell me to write songs, but no one can. If I, if I decide for a year I don't want to make any songs, I won't make any songs, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. So for me, it's been a thing where it, it, it comes when it comes. I think, you know, sometimes people make music and they, when, when, when someone becomes successful, and it can be in anything, you can attribute it to any sort of successes. If you are making something, the reason that first you're making it is one for, for hunger, I guess, because you need it to make it, to make yourself feel better, and then potentially also so you can make some sort of capital from it. But also, no, no, that's it. Mm. But, one, but once, um, one, oh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought, give me a sec. Yeah, but so <laughs> once, once, you, once, you, once you become successful, you don't need that anymore. There's no, there's no need, you know, like some musicians don't need to make money anymore. They don't need to, you know, right their wrongs and feel better because they feel better because some better things have happened. But stuff still happens, do you know what I mean? Like we were saying before, like if I go to the toilet, there could still be no toilet roll there. That's a shit thing that happens. So I'm human, do you know what I mean? That shit still happens to me. Or like I've got, I've got to pay bills. Say if I'm paying, I pay my mum's mortgage now, which is a wicked thing to do. But if I pay my mum's mortgage, that's no different from you paying the rent that you're paying at your house. It just might be more money, but it's still a bill. Do you know what I mean? And you look at people and you don't think, you say like someone becomes super famous and they become a musician. You look at them, especially rappers, you look at them and think well, like, like they're not paying bills. Do you know what I mean? Like they, they don't get their heart broken, like they don't fall in love. Do you know what I mean? These things still happen to everybody. Yeah. So why does it change as soon as you get paid? What's your favourite song that you have written? Favourite song that I've written? Yeah. Uh, Florence. Okay. Um, which is about... Um, it's about having a, a, a my mum my always wanted a, a daughter and she gave birth to me and she was like, oh, for fuck's sake. And then she gave, <laughs> yeah. and then she gave birth to my little brother like seven years later and she's like, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> and then after that she was like, not, not too old to have children, but it, it didn't happen again because um, we were probably too much of a handful. And so I'd always wanted a sister. And so when my dad passed away, the kind of the only thing that was really keeping us all going was the thought of having a little girl in the house, you know, like, a, like, a, like a, something new to be excited about. Um, and my mum had been talking about the possibility of us adopting a little girl. And it was the only thing that I could think of that would keep me happy. And so I went to the studio with a guy called Quez, again, um, who's a, a true genius. Um, and he was asking me how I feel. And he was saying he was really broody. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm kind of like that. I'm feeling that I would love a little sister. And so I wrote this song for my mum um, to explain how it would feel to have yeah, a little girl in the house for one day. So that's, yeah. Um, what, what would you say... Uh, just to change the topic and get, I, I suppose, like to your core. Yeah, whoa. <laughs> get there, come on. Okay, I'll change my question. You were just... <laughs> no, 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 get to my core. Yeah, we, we're trying, we, 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 we've core. got half an hour to do it. So, um, you were described as sensitive and eloquent by NME. Uh, that was their adjectives. How would you describe yourself? At ben, the core. Ben Coilana. I don't, yeah. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't know, it's very difficult to explain yourself. How would you explain yourself? Uh, Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> it, it, but do you see what I mean? It would, it would be so boring if no, I tried. No, I, I really don't believe that. We spent most of today together and he's actually a really cool guy, so I don't oh. know why he'd be saying that. I, I, do you know what I mean? It's like I can talk about you and say that you're wicked. You can say I'm wicked if you think that. But for yeah. me to say, hit sit and go, I'm this and I'm that. I don't, okay. One, I don't know. And yeah, you don't know. What, what are your three most, most obvious characteristics? Honesty. 
three most valued characteristics. Honesty, man. Come on. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fucking. Uh, obviously, I'm really no, I'm not funny. Uh, I don't know. I'm honest. I'm loyal. Pardon the pun. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, I don't know. Honestly, honest, loyal, um, and a good cook. I don't know if that can count. As a yeah, that, that, that works. So. That, that, that's a virtue. Um, <laughs> where do you see yourself heading in 10 years? Because your, your rise to fame has been massive. Mm. It's taken a while, though, which I like. I'll probably be 10 years older, I think, in 10 years. Yeah. No, I don't like... Um, <laughs> where would I be in 10 years? I want to be... I want to be, like... Uh, to be, just to be able to continue to be able to create. Honestly, if, where I want to be in 10 years, I want to um, I wanna have a restaurant. Yeah. Uh, for kids in my area um, that sells the food that they're used to eating but in a healthy way. Um, I want to have be able to make more music, want to have some kids. Um, I don't know, I want to just fucking continue to be happy, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Cause I'm doing all right. So does, that's, I want to be happy in 10 years. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the dream. Does the fame ever get to you? Do you ever wish you were invisible? <laughs> I did, but that's because I'm quite a big Harry Potter fan. Yeah. Um, I'd love a cloak. Yeah, yeah, the invisibility cloak was always a big dream of mine. It still is. Yeah. And in a place like, anyways, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, do you know what? No, so I, I, I don't have, I don't have social media on my phone anymore, um, because, especially if you, when you're, I don't know, for, for many reasons, and I think perhaps it's because it's different for me on my phone now, because I don't just get to check my phone and see what my mum's doing or you know. So you don't have Facebook. You don't have no, I don't have Facebook. I don't have Facebook page, but I don't like Instagram and stuff. I have it. Do you know what I mean, and I, and I post it to, 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 to support other musicians and to, you know, to. to um, to uh, promote my music and, and, and also to interact with people who, who might need my help. You know, someone, someone reached out to me because my mum is always on my, on my Twitter. Yeah. My mum is like my social media um, yeah, uh, guard. So she's on it every day. So she'll say, oh, so-and-so is messaging you saying this. And if something is of note, then I'll um, go on my computer and, and check it out. But I don't pay any attention to it. I mean, I live out in the sticks in Croydon. Um, um, yeah, I don't go out. I don't party that much. I work hard. I mean, I don't, I don't see it. So it doesn't change that much. Obviously, sometimes I might go out to get a beer and someone goes, oh, you're Laura Kana. But it's never been, oh, hey, can we get a photo? And then disappear, yeah. they have a conversation and I usually gain as much as they gain. You know? Sometimes people just grab me, which is a bit rude, but other than that. Yeah. Um, you spoke a bit about technology and, and the way that you tried to stay away from it. Um, the music industry has changed massively because there are tensions yeah. between... Like, you know I'm going to ask yeah, you. Yeah, go on, go okay. um, like, kind of what, what's your view on the changing of music and the fact that now everything's yeah. on Spotify? I think it's brilliant. You I, think it? it's, I think it's brilliant because before, new, like, record labels or uh, the industry, which is a thing that was built for, you know, for people who weren't musicians to, to make money off of musicians, do you know what I mean? So right now, it's in, it's in the power of, you know, a kid can be sat in Birmingham and before, if they'd have made a wicked album, no one would hear it because they weren't playing that, that one show, that one night in London because they couldn't get down and couldn't afford it. But now they slap it on SoundCloud or put it on YouTube and it can travel down to London or it can travel out to America or whatnot. So I think it's, it's expanded the horizons of, of, of people who really needed it. And yeah. I, I think it's, you know, it's a shame. I think some people are quite sour about it because poten potentially, you know, not no fault of theirs or, or ours, but they didn't have it, you know. So musicians or people who wanted to become something or to get their music out there couldn't because they didn't have the same. Yeah, because <laughs> some people have come out and said that... that um, it like massively affects the amount of money they make, mm -hmm. or that they're really kind of like only platform yeah. for some people. Yeah, but but music. If you're trying to make music to make money, then you know, like like people who make music to make music will always make music. If there's no if there's no money there, I didn't ever want to. I didn't not. I didn't ever want to make money. Of course I did. But I didn't. I didn't ever want to make money from music. I yeah. was I was just used to make music, and then people start going, "This is all right. Put it out." And I put it out, and people say, "This is nice." For the first like two years of playing shows, I didn't make any money from music. But I was doing it because I. Fucking love making music, and it was fun. I got to hang out with my best friend. Yeah, Get, that gets me quite emotional talking about. It. But like, if there was no money in it, or because right, there's no money in it now, I don't make any money from putting my album out. Yeah, but I don't care because I put my album. Out. I got to I got to sit at home, make an album that was that was alright and it was true to myself, and people listen to it, and I get to go play it around the world, and I get to play shows. When you play shows, that's when you get paid. You know, if someone asks you to be in an advert or something, that's when you get paid. And yeah. those are the things that come off the back of it, and it's a necessary beast sometimes for me to. You know, I don't want to have to stand in front of a camera and do this and do that, but it means that I can get paid enough to support my mum and make music. Do you have a new album coming out anytime soon? <laughs> no comment. Okay. No, no, do you know, I'm working on new music, but until, until it's completely ready to rock, I won't be saying anything about it. But it'll be a while. Because yeah. I think albums are supposed to take a while, and I think that's the, that's the one issue with, with social media and with, with the internet, is that now anything you create, it's not just music, if you create, you know, well, I'll use music as an example, that... Everything is that there's win like the, the the generation of like the six second video of like vines and whatnot, even though vines over now, is that there's, there's people everyone's so impatient. So you make something and goes, that's cool. Where's the next thing? 
and where's the next thing, where's the next thing, where's the next thing? Whereas, you know, especially with an album or with a song, these things take a long time to create. And if you, are, if you treat them like they're dispensable, then you'll kind of, I guess, corrupt the people who are making them because, um, I'm not saying any of you do this, by the way, it sounds like I'm like lecturing at you, but no, it's, it's, I think it's important for me to, to take the time to reinstall some patience into people who listen to my music. Because yeah. I get messages all day, every day going, yo, give me new music now, man, it's been too long. And it's like, well, I can give you something now and it'll be shit, or I can give you something that I truly believe in in a year's time. Yeah. And hopefully it won't be shit. But you, you're writing stuff as it comes. Yeah, yeah, of course. I write stuff all the time because stuff's always happening. Yeah. One of the things that I have read is you're a very outspoken Corbynite. Uh, is that true? Yeah, man. Well, I had, yeah, okay, cool. Good. <laughs> um, yeah. You have a huge platform and yeah. like, obviously some pretty massive views. Yeah. Have you ever thought about uh, how you're going to use the platform or whether you'd like, go into politics as an inspirational figure or... Tell you what, the thing that I, I, I feel the most about, the two things I feel the most about is, one of them sounds trivial, but it's not, is um, children at secondary schools, especially in um, kind of in lower um, income families and, and those areas and you know, the ghettos of the UK, is um, them eating bad food, eating chicken and chips. So I'll, I'll explain that in a second. And the second one is, um, oh, I've lost it. Fuck it, I'll tell you the chicken chips. <laughs> Basically, so chicken and chips are really important. So I went to school, and before that I was vegetarian, I went to secondary school. When I went to secondary school, um, we were allowed to go out to get food, which is sick. So I'd never eaten meat before. My friends were like, yeah, come to the chicken shop. I went to the chicken shop. What an experience it was. <laughs> but chicken and chips, every chicken and chip shop that you go to in London, and probably outside of London also, or actually it, outside London, is frozen chicken. So the issue with that is, especially for young kids, if you're getting it every day after school because it's cheap, um, it's frozen, so when you deep fry it, you have to leave it in the oil for longer so it gets full of saturated fats. Also, the chicken's not um, happy, which I don't know if you believe in karma, but if you believe in karma, if you eat something that's shit and had a shit life, you'll probably have a shit time that day. So what I wanted to do was give kids better food, but you can't, so Jamie Oliver did this thing about giving yeah. kids better food at school. Sick, but if you give kids better food at school, um, that's all green and doesn't look anything like the food they want to eat, they won't eat it. So you have to give them the food they want to eat in a healthier way, like baked chicken. Which brings me on, I won't tell you that, but I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, but what was my other point? Fuck. Uh, what was the question? Um, platform and politics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. But I would, I would never put it in my music, I don't think. I, I do put it in my music, but I wouldn't put it outwardly into my music. So um, Public Enemy, NWA, these people, you, uh, kind of four forefathers of, of, of hip-hop and also political hip-hop. But everyone I talk to about Public Enemy says that they didn't understand that Public Enemy was political until 10 years later, because they were just too busy listening to the chorus and enjoying it and being out partying and whatnot. And as soon as someone, I guess, as soon as someone becomes preachy and it isn't about the music, that's when it's lost, you know? So I talk about my student loan, because I missed my student loan, and it was when I was one of the, I was like the, one of the years, the first years where it got brought up from two, whatever it was, before to nine, oh no, I just know it was 9,000, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I was pissed about it, so I say that, but I don't say, my name is Lord Khan and I'm very upset about, you know, having to be charged 6,000 more pounds a year. But I put it in my song, and people, because people sing along, people don't think that that's a political line. But it is, because yeah. I was pissed off about it, and hopefully some change will happen. Yeah, yeah. And you speak a bit about, like, the different people that influence you. Mm -hmm. Who are your musical idols? Musical idols. Because you, you've got quite unique music in that it's kind of, like, jazzy, soul-y rap. <laughs> is, that, is that fair? Is that right? <laughs> It's, like it's not what they say yeah, on Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, no, you heard it at first. Yeah, no, but it is. Um, my, 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 my musical inspiration, well, I, I guess, honestly, is my mum and my yeah. dad are my musical inspirations because they expanded my horizons when it came to music. So before yeah. that, you know, I've always been a big fan of, of, um, of UK music, so grime and hip-hop and garage, and also I've been a big fan of American hip-hop, and that's kind of where I find my, my truth because they, these are people who look just like me who were making something, making something of themselves and came from a background that I had. So a lot of the rappers I'm big fans of, you know, grew up without their dads. Yeah. Sort of thing I did, pardon me. It's like I did um, in, in, in some capacity, you know, and we're, we're confused about their race and where they fit into a society that doesn't quite want them there. Do you know what I mean? And so I think that's why I loved hip hop. But my mum and my dad used to say, yeah, that's, that's wicked. And this is, this, is, this is progressive. But also, have you listened to this? Because what that guy's saying is just like what Sid Vicious is saying right here. That's exactly what David Bowie's saying right here. You know, and they introduced yeah. me to punk. You know, and, and I think that, that was important because my dad used to say to me all the time um, that punk was, yeah, the, the, he, he was kind of ridiculous. It was, a bit, it was a bit cringy what he said, but he'd be like, yeah, um, punk is not dead, just the beat has changed. And I'd be like, oh, dad, shut up. But yeah. it's true because you listen to hip-hop. Hip-hop is punk music because it is against the grain. It's anti-establishment, which is exactly what punk music was, you know? So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, okay, great. Um, what's your advice? Because there, there's a load of people here in this room with different ambitions, uh, and I'm not sure what they are. But what is your advice to people um, that would want to get into the music industry? Because it's changing massively, you said that. Yeah, um, don't, don't sign as few contracts as you can, because the more control you have, the better. 
Um, work with people that you trust. I don't, I don't know. I, I think work, work with your friends. Don't try and, you know, don't believe anyone at a bar or at an open mic who says they're going to make you a star because the only person who can, who, you, who can create something, you can create something with someone that you're close to and someone that you trust. I come, this is my manager here. I'm sorry to hot you up. This is Tom. We met a long time ago and I trust him with my life. But also we're very good friends before anything else. Um, but he isn't like anyone I've met in the music industry. And the people that you meet, who you, people who I've met who work, who, who've become successful or, or have good people around him, I say, oh, when did you become a manager? When did you, when did you meet a manager? It's like, yeah, well, he wasn't a manager before he met me because he didn't, there was no reason to do it. But he was, Tom wasn't looking for money. Tom was looking to help me put my music out, which makes him a, just a decent person. So I think, yeah, work with people that you trust. Yeah, I don't know, man. Just don't worry about what other people are doing, I think. Don't look on social media to see, oh, so-and-so's got more views than me or so-and-so's doing this. Just get on with what you're doing because that's where it's at. Yeah. Sounds like, like surround yourself by positive people. Yeah, yeah, but just not... Positive, but not, you know, not yes men, just people, real people. Well, not yeah. even real, that's such a whack thing to say. People, but, <laughs> but it is, that's fucking whack. People who just, who are, who are honest to you. If, like, if, some, if I do something that's shit, people around me will say, that shit, that was shit, you shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Wicked. And I go, yeah, you're right. Because otherwise, if, if you do, do something shit and you think it's good and everyone's saying it's good, then you're hurting yourself, you're hurting them, you know, hurting the people who are hearing it. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, it's time to open up questions to the floor. I know there's a lot that have come in. This is, this if you do want to ask a question, just stick your hand up, wait for someone with a mic. Uh, to come to you, like to mark by a really obvious fluorescent jacket. Yeah, so can we go to, to the second row just back there? Mike's. Yeah, to, to you, to Thea, to Thea. <laughs> What's up, Thea? Hi. Um, I don't know if you saw a couple of days ago in the Daily Mail, they ran a story about Skepta and Naomi Campbell and yep. uh, on the front page of GQ yep. and wasn't particularly positive about it. Um, I was wondering what you, whether you had any thoughts about newspapers such as the Daily Mail and... Fuck the Daily Mail. <laughs> 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 but, but, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and just kind of what, what, if anything, can be done to kind of yeah. rise up against these yeah. kind of monopolistic... Don't read it, do you know what I mean? But, but, so, <laughs> so, so um, um, me and my missus actually had a long chat about this um, over dinner, like, yesterday. Um, uh, and what the thing, the Daily Mail thing is actually that they were talking about is Wiley was in there. Wiley just got um, an MBE. And Wiley's one of the first rappers I've ever met um, who, you know, he's in a, I guess in a bit of a separate genre to me, but is, he still is a rapper who's kind of fully embraced me very quickly. So I met him quickly and he was so supportive and was acted like he was very proud of me and he was someone I never met before. So he's a, he's a true pioneer and he's definitely saving a lot of kids. Um, but anyways, um, I digress. What, uh, what the issue was is that in, in, in the newspaper they were saying the, the, the tagline was grime does pay, um, drug dealer gets MBE, which is bullshit. Yes, he did do bad things. Yes, he's rapped about them, but he has saved a lot of children. But how you get away from these, these things is one is to, not, is to not look at them, don't click on them, don't, don't interact with them at all. At my shows, The Sun, The Daily Mail, The Mirror, they're all banned. They can't come to my show. They can't review my show because I don't give a fuck what they have to say, and you shouldn't give a fuck what they have to say because it's racist, it's homophobic. You know, it's 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 not. It's yeah. It's yeah. It's bullshit. That's how I feel. <laughs> um. uh, can we go? Yeah, four rows back to to the guy in blue jumper. Hi. Yeah. Um, you talk a lot about your dad. And um, my dad died like in 2016, a couple of years, a couple of weeks before I came to uni. Mm -hmm. And two of my closest friends' dads passed away in the past year, yeah. which was not like a sub story. There's a question. Yeah. Um, Can I give you a hug? Sorry. Can I give you a hug? I'm coming. Please. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. <laughs> Come on. Thank you. It's all right. No, not at all. Big love, though. Yeah. Thank you. So I got. I will chat. I'll chat to you after. Uh, question was going to be. What would your kind of advice be? Because obviously you kind of deal with it through your music. Mm -hmm. But for people who are kind of dealing with grief, mm -hmm. who aren't that like expressive in that way, mm -hmm. what would your advice be? And also what would your advice be to people supporting people with grief? Because mm -hmm. it's kind of a big thing now, like with all my friends. So. Um, do you know what? It's, yeah, music, I was lucky because that was the thing I got to do. But I, I love to cook. And cooking for me was something that really helped. And I think everyone needs to cook. So that's one, one thing I would definitely suggest just because... Yeah, it's, it, you feel good because it, I don't know, maybe it's just because i got ADHD, but when, when, when cooking is happening, there's nothing else I can think about because something's on fire here and something's in the oven there and there's something else going on here. And there's, you can kind of be distracted by the same thing, so it feeds into the same thing. But, you know, really it's about, you know, one, throwing yourself into it, but also talking about it, finding people that you trust to talk about it, and if that's seeking counsel from a professional or if it's seeking counsel from your friends, is, is, is just understanding it and looking into how, you, how it makes you feel because for a long time, so when my dad died, I couldn't deal with it at first because I had to look after my mum, my little brother. So they went to see counsellors, 
Um, they won't mind me saying that. My brother might, so don't tell anyone. Um, but um, but they, they went to do that, and I didn't have a chance to do it because I was kind of busy being there for them. And when I finally got a chance to do it and chat to somebody, which I'm not embarrassed to say because I think every man and every woman, but more men because men don't feel like they can talk about this kind of shit, um, was to talk about my feelings and understand actually what it meant and look into myself. And that's a fucking scary thing to do, but you have to do it. So once you look at yourself and think, how do I really feel about this and how does this really make me feel? And when, when you don't hide from it and don't avoid it, that's when you, you, know, you can you can talk to your friends about it and also you, they, they, they feel comfortable to talk to you because they don't feel like you're, you know. I think that's a difficult thing because sometimes your friends feel like they can't talk to you because they don't want to make you sad. It's like, yeah, I'm fucking sad, but I'm, I'm still here. Do you know what I mean? I'm still alive and I, and I need to do something because my dad wouldn't want me to just sit around and do fuck all. So that's what I would say. Okay, yeah, can we get to the second row while the microphone is there? Nice. Oh, so yeah, just, so just here. Cheers. Hi, yeah. Um, so you're talking about your cooking career and how you might want to become a cook. Um, yeah. And I've heard about your ADHD cooking school. And I was just wondering, just looking to the future, do you have any aspirations to expand that and maybe after you've done some more music, just go into that more as a sort of full-time thing? Yeah, I'll tell you my idea, but you have to promise you won't take it. <laughs> go for it. Actually, I can't because you, like, you might, but someone might see it if I take <laughs> it. But uh, that is my plan. That was my plan before I made music and it'll be my plan alongside it. I've always done it alongside it. Um, the cooking school will grow. I want to get to I want to get to the point where I've got a, 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 a school. I want to have a school where you know it's for kids with special educational needs that can come and learn to cook. Much like the Brit School is for performing arts, have you know the school of local. <laughs> that is that is about that that that, that helps kids uh, you know find a find a pathway to, to something that I don't know. There's the famous you know the famous um, Einstein quote about the idea of you can have a fish and a monkey and an elephant all sat in a classroom. And if they're all judged on how they climb a tree, then one will come out on top. But they're all different people and they can all do different things. You know what I mean? So I think putting, putting kids that are neurodiverse and think outside the box in a, in a situation where they, they can be the, the top dog is important for me. But yeah, I always want to open a restaurant. I'm going to call it RQB. And it stands for something, but I can't tell you what it stands for. But it's, good, it's a good one. Can I just backtrack a bit? What is the ADHD cooking school? Yeah, so I got, uh, yeah, I got this cooking school for, for kids of ADHD um, between the ages of 14 to 16. Um, I set it up because, um, yeah, like I said, um, I, I, I love cooking and it was, having ADHD, it was the one thing that used to really calm me down. And I thought potentially, because it worked for me, it could work for children in a similar situation, but I wasn't sure. And so I set it up with a friend of mine called Mikey, who's a wicked kid, and I reckon he'll be here having a chat on this chair soon. He's, he's um, just turned 20. Um, he's, he's set up like a surf school in Rishima in Brazil, um, where he's cleaned out the pollution from the ocean for the kids so they can do something. Um, instead of just hang out in the favelas all day. He helps me in the cooking school. He's, yeah, he's a wicked kid. But anyways, we set up this school, um, um, and it runs in the summer, and it's just for kids to come down. Because when I was cooking, what was wicked about it is I was kind of shit at, not shit at stuff at school, but I got made to feel like I was shit at stuff at school. Um, but with, with the cooking school, these kids come to me, and they say, you know, oh, I'm this, I'm that, and no one, no one believes me, no one, no one believes in me. And they'd make something, that would be delicious. And so straight away, I can pat them on the back and say, you're wicked. And it's that, being able to, one, offer them, you know, like a, a confidence boost, also to, to, to give them a life skill. And because when I was making music, so it's a bit of a long-winded answer, but when I, when I was making music, people used to say to me, yeah, you're an activist for ADHD. Not what I said, but what people say about me, because I think activists, whatever, it's just, I'm, I just, I, I care about it. But um, they would say, yeah, but being a musician is quite a, quite a niche thing. So you're saying, yeah, you're lucky. You're, you're lucky because you can work in something that is, 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 is perfect for your ADHD, but also you know, makes a lot of money from, but not everyone can do that. And I said, but everybody can cook and every kitchen in London is short of, is short of cooks. So why not, you know, take the same energy and the same, uh, you know, a aggression into something that is, is world, you know, kind of worldwide, so. Wow, that's huge. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, can we go back to the fourth row just there? Cheers. What's up? What's up, man? I'd like to say welcome to uh, Cambridge. I hope you're having a nice time. Oh, fucking uh, no way. <laughs> Thanks for yeah. having me, mate. Uh, yeah, big fan of your music. Um, what I was going to ask is that, um, so yeah, obviously, yeah, our mixed race, my parents are divorced. Yeah. Um, my beard's dead, so. I yeah, your beard's better than mine, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you've got this, though. This yeah, one I it, it, it connects a bit, but not yeah. that much. So. Mine doesn't connect. That's why I'm yeah. waiting for. I've got this Craig Resident, David yeah, thing. Yeah, so um, I've always just lived with my mum. I went yeah. to a state school, and I was thinking, um, how would you, like, so you haven't been to a public school um, and the fact that a lot of like the UK rap scene come come up from being like like kind of road utes yeah how would you how how do you feel 
Do you feel like you would have been received in the same way if you happened to be like a white guy that had come up through your same? No, can I tell you, because I got, I got a scholarship is one thing I forgot mm. to say when I went to public school. I didn't get paid into public school. I went there and was, um, was yeah, I shouldn't have been there was how, mm. I, was how I was treated while I was there because I was there without paying. And a lot of people around me were paying, do you know what I mean? So um, paid a little bit, but nowhere near what you have to pay to go there. Um, yeah, I think, I, I don't know if they would. I've, I, I've always been, when I was at school, I always got treated like that because of, one, because I was mixed race anyway. So it's a very difficult thing being mixed race because it's a relatively new thing in over here. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, like um, there's a wicked book by Pauline Black, who's from the Selector. Selector, well, if that's wrong, it's going to be embarrassing. But it's like, it's an old scar, old scar group. But she's one of like, when she was mixed race in London, she was one of the first mixed race kids in her town to be mixed race. So she's in, yeah, I think she was in North. I can't remember, that's probably wrong, but it's good for the story. But she was mixed race. She goes to school when there's nobody mixed race. One black kid, two black kids, loads of white kids, but no one's mixed race. And so it's, it's, it's almost like as much as when I was at school, all the black kids used to be like, yeah, but you're white though. And then all the white kids would be like, yeah, but you're black though. So as much as black kids didn't fit in at school, I didn't fit in at all because I didn't even get to go to the black kids and go, yo, I'm one of you, so I don't know if, if I'd have been received differently. Everyone, everyone assumes that I'm posh because I, I speak well. Because I speak well, there's nothing I can do about it, do you know what I mean? My mum spoke well, so I speak well. I, just, I, I grew up in West Norwood. Bad things happen in West Norwood every day. I know people who've done very bad things, but and I talk to them like this, and they know I'm the one who talks like this because I talk like this, you know? Fuck it. <laughs> when, when did you drop that? Um, so you, you said you dropped out of, um, of university. Yeah, when did you, St. Martin's. What, when did you clock that you could make um, music something that you could make as kind of your living? Do you know what? I'd, well, just what, honestly, when people start giving me cash, like, <laughs> no, 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 not, not to be stupid, but because uh, it was something I was doing, I was like, this is wicked, but I was doing it because it was keeping me busy, because I like to be busy. But I wasn't thinking, yeah, this could, be, this could be it. I could make cash from this. I was thinking, let me just run with it and enjoy it, because I was really enjoying it. But just when, when, people started, when, when people started asking for meetings and they start talking about money, you know, and, and it can be of anything if you're setting up a business and you set up like a pop-up um, market store and someone goes, well, can we want to talk to you about maybe opening a premises? And you can go, yeah, cool. And then as soon as they start saying, so we're thinking maybe like 20,000 pounds, you go, well, fuck, 20,000 pounds. And when someone starts talking about figures of money to me, I was like, right, that's just from this. Yeah, definitely. But that, that's when, just, just when people started having a conversation with me because I wasn't looking for it, but it came, it found me annoyingly. Has there been a moment where you've been like, yeah, I've made, like a light bulb moment where no, you're like, no, yeah, no. I've made it? No, because then, like, I don't know, I feel quite strongly that if anyone thinks that they've made I, I, I haven't made it, so I'm not saying it just to sound mm -hmm. humble or whatnot, but if you, anyone who believes that they have made it is when everything falls to shit, because then you don't need to do anything. If you think you've made it, then what are you chasing? The reason I want to open a restaurant, the reason I want to make another album is because I don't feel like the stuff I've done yet is good enough. Yeah. So when I start feeling everything, I've, if, when I feel like everything's good enough, I'll go, I'll go to Barbados and I'll hang out and I'll spend my money. But right now, I don't have time to do that because I've got to keep making stuff. Yeah. That's better than the stuff I made before. Uh, yeah, can we go to the third row back? Cheers. Sure. Hi, Ben. Hello. Um, <laughs> I was going to ask a question about songwriting um, because I really like singing and I kind of want to be a singer. But every time I write songs, in my head, I'm just thinking, this is dead, this is dead, yeah, this yeah. is dead. So I was like, wondering, how do you like, get over that barrier of like, self-doubt and like creation. Um, how do, you do you know what it is? It's about, my mum used to say to me, it's about create and move on. So I write a lot of stuff that shit happens. Do you know what I mean, but it's one is about knowing what, what you like of your stuff and what you don't like of your stuff is an important thing and having a filter. Because sometimes I say stuff and I put stuff down and I go, that's not, that's not all that. But it's all about getting it out because these things still have to come out. Even if they don't come out beautifully, there's some things I've had to say and put on paper so I can understand them. But it's just about keep going. Do you know what I mean? If you write something and it's not good, keep going with it. There's a thing, because you can, if you sit down and go to write something and you write like three lines and you go, oh, this is whack, then that's it for the day. And you've cut your own creativity. If you go, oh, let me run with this, and you write something more and you write something more, and then that's unlocked. So then you get into a, whatever it is, you know, like deeper understanding of that subject, or you, or you feel like you're a bit more emotional at that point, or you feel a bit more open. You can't, you know, it's like, it's like going to the gym and doing one pull up and then going, where are the, do you know what I mean? You have, to, you have to put in the work before you can flex your, I don't have any, but you know. Yeah. If I did, I'd flex them. Yeah. Okay, yeah, can we go just there? Yeah, with the orange. Hi, um, hey. I have a question. You, so you started singing because you were writing. Could you be able now to write but not sing anymore and give your writing to somebody else to sing it? Or now you, like, your writing became I you and you need to show it yourself to sing no, it yourself? I do both, so... 
the reason that the reason that I started rapping was because I wanted people to I I, I enjoyed getting what I wanted out there, but I do both. So. <laughs> Hi, how are you doing? Like, how are you? I'm. Um, yeah. <laughs> I feel like everyone asks questions about yeah, how you're yeah, doing. Yeah, I'm all right. I tell you, what, better, like better than I've been, That's better than I ever been. I think I'm pretty spot on at the moment. Um, that wasn't my question, but I'm glad to see Thanks. that you're doing well. <laughs> uh, Tough um, one. Good fucking question. <laughs> Thanks for asking. It took no, a second ago. Um, I used to read Benjamin Zephaniah's poetry when I was younger. My favorite. Yeah. Um, don't ask me like my favorite because I can't remember. I remember there's a yellow book. Yeah. But I just wanted to ask you, like, what was it like meeting him, and like, has he influenced you in any way? Massively. Well, meeting him one was exciting for me because. He, he was like a male role model of mine, and I never got to meet him. I didn't really have many male role models, so to chat to him and to get any pearls of wisdom, when you're like a young man who has no dad, it's fucking important to, to get any 30 seconds you can get with a grown man, because they can tell you all the, all the mistakes you're making, and say, did you make any mistakes? Because I'm, I'm making quite a few, and I'd like you to stop me from making as many. But it was amazing for me. It was surreal. I didn't really want to talk. It was annoying because it was on camera. Um, and I've met, I've met some of my heroes, um, other heroes of mine, and they've been dicks, because that happens sometimes. Um, and I was worried when I met him that he would be a dick, and he wasn't. Um, he was really genuine, and he was what was what blew my mind is that he, I, I thought it'd been put, it was put together basically. Benjamin Zephaniah is my favorite, one of my favorite poets, and he was he was dyslexic, and there was a poster of him up at school, um, in the main room, and it said um, uh, Benjamin Zephaniah, brilliant dyslexic, and he was my hero one because he was a poet because he wrote rhymes, but also because I identified myself with him, and so when it got put together, and I've I've been very open about speaking about this, so when it got put together, I thought that. They'd reached out and said, Lord Khan's a big fan. He was like, who the fuck's that? Oh, whatever, I need some promo, I'll do it. But it turned out that he, when they reached out to him, he had my album already and was a fan of mine. And yeah, mm, yeah, makes me cry almost thinking about it. So I can't, it's difficult to talk about, but it meant everything to me. Oh, thank you, thank you for asking about it. Thank you for asking how I was as well. So on that note, we actually had one final thing to ask. Um, and that's that you're into poetry. I feel like you're probably into rapping. Um, and you said your album's not coming out for a little while. Yeah. Uh, for the Cambridge Union, yeah. is there anything you could give us? Yeah. A, a bit of Lord Carter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can. <laughs> do you want me to stand up? Or I you, we've got another mic. I, I don't know how. I can do it like this. Do it, I can do it. Can I just do it sat down like this? I'll, sit, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll kind of perch half like this, so I'm kind of <laughs> half up. Half down, no, I'm joking. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Actually, I wrote a poem recently because I've been touring a lot. Um, and it's been like highs and lows, do you know what I mean? So, yeah, I'll give it to you anyways. It's a bit new though, so go easy on me, please. <coughs> Hang on, I've got a bit of a block now. <laughs> Fuck the tension. Imagine all the friends you see most. Each one you're paying a wage, dependent on you putting pen to the page. So you break it down, checking they're paid. Another day your heart breaks, you were sent to the stage. You feel the same rage. You watch the crowd, watch the stage thinking. You're rather in the crowd with your mates drinking. Misbehaviors, catch another day and winking. You guzzle Jaegers, feel ashamed. Your brain's sinking. You think it's deep, but don't think it's depression. A misspent adolescence, but all this time is of the essence. And you ain't never learnt from your lessons. Stuck in that same quintessence of heartbreak, one in the same. The days change, but you're stuck in a game. It's like she's telling you you're young enough to be at uni. Somehow the one who sees through me. Check it. I'm tired of it falling on top of me. I'm getting drunk. I ain't sorting it properly. There's misbehaviors. I'm born for the stages. There's seven different wages. I'm caught in monopoly. My little brother's trying to finish up the broccoli. I'm under lock and key. Bought more property. I told my mother there ain't no stopping me. I spend cash today because there's more cash tomorrow, Gene. There's all sorts of apologies. I'm black and white, so I brought in equality. Fuck. They never thought to acknowledge these. We just lost another one. Rest in peace, prodigy. Uh, the infamous and we're mobbing deep. You never catch me where the thugs or the robbers be. I lose sleep and it ain't no surprise. I never follow one man to his own demise. It's like that. <laughs> Shall we? No comment. Thank you. <laughs>